Tuesday, November 23rd. We woke up this morning to unusually cold weather. I ate breakfast across from Dad at the round table. He was reading the sports section of the Times. I was on the verge of asking him, Dad, did you see Eric hit Tino in the face so hard he nearly knocked him out? But I didn't. I couldn't. I had the words all picked out, but I couldn't say them. I sat there agonizing about it. Why couldn't I tell? I'd ratted out Tino to the carnival at the carnival. Why couldn't I tell my own parents about Eric? What was wrong with me? What was wrong with all of us? Anyway, I didn't say a word to dad. I didn't say anything to mom on the ride in either. Tino and Teresa were both absent from school, so I didn't have to face them. Henry D was there, but he and I managed to avoid each other all day. While I was waiting for mom to pick me up, I thought briefly about asking her to help me, but try as I might, I couldn't think of any good that could come from it. Even if she believed me completely, what could she do? Get Eric to issue a phony apology to Tino? That stuff doesn't play in Tangerine. Anyway, who's to say she would do anything about Eric? She's never done anything about him before. So mom and I rode out of Tangerine the same way we rode in in silence. Mom has a lot on her mind these days, worrying about not only our home, but every other home in Lake Windsor Downs. Now that soccer season is over, I'm back to accompanying her on her endless errands. This afternoon's first stop was at our climate-controlled storage bin on Route 22. When we reached the storage place, Mom finally asked, hey, why doesn't Joey Costello come over anymore? Did you two have a fight? Yeah, I guess so. What was it about? A girl? No. Then what was it? I thought about that one for a long time. I thought about Joey's attitude on that first day. I remembered what he said about Teresa. I finally said, you're right. It was about a girl. Mom unlocked the garage type door and waited for me to hoist it up for her. She went over to some boxes marked winter, put her key down, and scanned the labels on them until she found one marked sweaters, etc. She said, here, give me a hand. I went over to the stack and lifted the top two boxes so she could remove the third one. As mom handed it over to me, she said, do you smell that? There's insecticide in here too. Yeah, that's life in Florida. Mom quickly handed back, headed back out into the fresh air. Tell me about it, I hate that smell. I lifted the sweaters, etc. box onto my shoulder, stepped outside, and put the bin door down. It clicked and locked. Mom patted the pocket of her jeans. Oh no! What? My key. My key is inside. Well, they must have some way to let people in. Do they have a master key in the office? Mom looked shocked. Oh, I hope not. This is supposed to be our private space. They're never supposed to come in here. Then how would they get in to spray for bugs? Mom thought about that. They wouldn't. Then she snapped her fingers. Eric, Eric has a key. He can stop in here and get mine. We climbed back into the car. I said, why does Eric have a key? I don't know, honey, because he asked for one. You can have one too if you want. I said, I don't need one. Where are we going now? I have to be at the high school at four o'clock. I have a meeting. I figured you could watch the football team practice, okay? What's the meeting about? It's about Eric. I'm meeting with his guidance counselor. Yeah? Why? What did he do? Do? Nothing, Paul. I mean, there's no incident that they called about. Is, is that what you mean? Yes. Why? Why would you say that? I thought, because Eric is a psycho, Mom. Do you really not know that? But I didn't say it. Mom and Dad, don't like it when I say things like that. Mom asked again, has Eric done something that I need to know about? I thought to myself, that you need to know about? And I answered honestly, no. 
mom nodded then explained. This is more of an academic conference. Eric's grades has, have slipped. Mom looked at me and added, it, it's not unusual for an athlete during the season to slack off a little. I didn't. What, dear? I'm an athlete, a, a champion athlete, in fact, and I didn't slack off during the season. We turned at Seagull Way and drove to the south entrance of the high school. Mom parked in the shadow of the steel gray bleachers and turned off the car. She finally said, I know you had a good season, Paul, a great season. Remember me? I'm the one who drives you back and forth to that place every day. I looked at her, but I didn't say anything. She got angry. Give me some credit where credit is due. Who do you think makes this all possible? Who do you think holds this thing together? Your father? I had the answer for that one. No. She got out and walked inside. I sat in the car for a minute, then moved cautiously toward the sound of football practice. I was determined to avoid Eric and Arthur, so I ducked under the bleachers. I picked my way over the steel bars, getting closer and closer to the front, until a row of seats was resting on, on top of my head. To the right, I could see Antoine Thomas and another black guy with huge muscles practicing center snaps. To my left, I could see Eric and Arthur, and they were at the center of a group of admirers that included Tina and Paige and a couple of skinny football guys. Just about everyone else was trudging toward the western exit of the field. Practice was over. I watched as the first group of players passed through the opening at the far end of the bleachers, heading toward their cars. Suddenly, a familiar color caught my eye. A green Ford pickup rolled into view and parked in a space near the gate. The old Ford looked odd, out of place among the expensive import sports cars and four by fours. What was it doing here? Luis Cruz got out and stared intently at the people who were leaving. He stopped one player and spoke to him. The player listened, then pointed down toward Eric's group. Louis started walking in his limping style through the gate and down the sideline. He continued on past Antoine and the muscle man who were now sitting on the bleachers watching him. What was he doing here? He stopped right in front of my hiding place and waited. Eric and his group had gathered up their gear and were, pre were preparing to leave. Louis stood in their path like the brave sheriff of a town full of cowards. When Eric's group got close enough, Luis called out, which one is Eric Fisher? He looked Eric right in the eye. Is that you? Eric opened his eyes wide in mock terror. He turned to Arthur and said, we may have a situation here, Bauer. The others in the group seemed amused. Arthur started to walk slowly west. His hand fumbled inside his gym bag. Louise continued in a loud voice. I think you are, but I think you are not man enough to say so. And ooh, sound rose up from the group. Eric just smiled and met Louise's stare. Louise held his long arms out and extended his palms. You would smack a little kid in the face, right? Why don't you come over here and try to smack me? The ooh grew louder. Arthur Bauer was still walking forward with his head down, but Luis was paying no attention to him. He called out again, come on, why don't you try to smack me? Arthur reached Luis, turned, and whipped the blackjack around with a loud whack against the side of Luis's head. Luis's arm shot up to cover his head as he staggered to the right and fell on one knee. Arthur stuck the blackjack back into his gym bag and continued walking as if nothing had happened. Eric walked quickly past Luis. He explained for the benefit of his group, hmm, Arthur takes care of all my light work. Eric and the rest of them caught up with Arthur at the gate. I could see they were laughing. Antoine and the muscle man were not. They stood up. They walked out to Luis and examined his injury. From where I was, I couldn't see any blood. They helped Luis to his feet and talked to him for a few minutes, and then they walked him 
walked with him to his truck. Louise seemed pretty steady. I remained frozen in my spot as he got back in the Ford and drove off. I don't know how much later it was when mom came out from her conference and found me there. She called out, Paul, are you playing under there? What are you doing, hiding? I pulled myself together and picked my way back over the steel bars. We drove all the way home in silence except for one remark. Mom said, the conference went very well. The guidance counselor thinks this football stardom business has gone to Eric's head. She thinks he'll be better off once football season is over and it is nearly over. Hmm. Nearly over? In our family, it's never over. The dream lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year. The dream has four years at a big time college ahead of it. And then who knows, maybe the NFL.